Welcome to the Exposing Mold podcast, where I, Keely Severson, Eric Johnson, and Alicia Swamy dive into all things toxic mold. Eric Johnson is known for his history with being an original prototype for chronic fatigue syndrome. And he also, based on his experience in squad tactics for bioweapon protocols in the military, has developed a very unique theory about the effect that could be happening that is affecting us. And this is the foundation of Eric's nanoparticle theory. Eric, would you care to talk a little bit about the decontamination protocols for bioweapons that you learned in the Army and how you were able to connect this to your mold theory? Yeah, I had some um, tangles with black mold prior to my military experience. In fact, as a child, I ran into it and had a growing awareness that I felt better outside than indoors. But uh, the qualities of contamination were still so overwhelming, they were very confusing to me. And when I got sick at Truckee High School, which is the site of the original chronic fatigue syndrome cluster, I was aware that just getting out of a building wasn't enough. I actually had to leave the surrounding area that indicated some kind of contamination was affecting the entire um, area in front of the school. So over time, I became aware that I needed to put more focus into avoiding these bad zones and um, developing some kind of strategy to deal with this. Now, my um, situation kept getting gradually worse over the years and actually influenced my decision to join the army because I hoped that the army doctors might be able to help me with this. I was still pretty athletic and was able to function quite well. And I thought, well, maybe uh, going into the army will toughen me up, uh, beat this horrible thing out of me. And if anything, I might have access to military technology that will help me, you know, assist me in getting through this problem. I soon found that the army knew nothing about it. <laughs> and even though there were certain buildings in the army um, that affected me, I really wound up in a bad situation by being stationed in a bunker built to be Adolf Hitler's forward headquarters for the invasion of Great Britain. Uh, this was about 70 kilometers north of Frankfurt, completely reinforced concrete, multiple levels disguised to look like an office complex when it was really an underground um, entire military complex of tanks and communications equipment. It was, would be difficult to spot from the air, but um, this amazing structure is uh, it's still there. And uh, they, they did clean up a lot of the mold, but during my military um, stint there, I noticed that the vents from the underground bunkers, that um, when I was out for a run out in the woods, I would pass by these vents and get knocked flat. So I realized that I had to stay away from them. And then in 1976, the, um, place flooded, the basement armory got completely soaked and my entire unit got sick. People started falling apart with viral infections, fungal infections, bacterial infections. It was as if our immune systems had completely disappeared. My commanding officer was scared. He uh, called the uh, division of the biological warfare investigation to come out and take a look. And they looked at the mold and they attached no importance to it. They said, well, you know, it's, it's bad. You've got black mold growing, growing on the uh, cardboard boxes down in the armory, but uh, we really don't know what's going on. But they advised that we clean it up. So I suggested to my commanding officer that the mold really was dangerous, toxic, and asked if we could use our uh, M17A1 gas masks during the, uh, the cleanup. And he said that was a good idea. In fact, he um, 
contacted battalion headquarters and asked permission to use gas masks. And they said, no, permission denied. Those are reserved for warfare. They're expensive. And uh, you, you're just cleaning up mold. And it turns out that that probably was a mistake. <laughs> At least for me, it was. Because I was detailed to go down there and clean up that mold. And within several hours, my squad leader looked over at me and said, Johnson, if you don't get out of here now, we're going to have to carry you out of here. I went up to my bunk and crashed and literally couldn't move for the next 24 hours. And that was probably a turning point for me because from that point on, I was never able to quite recover from toxic mold again. That's actually why I got out of the military is because I was having so much difficulty that um, I realized that if I wound up stationed in another moldy area, or if this remediation failed to work, I was going to be completely incapacitated. So um, in 1977, an opportunity came up to participate in the military folks march, the Nijmegen march. It's the annual four day uh, folks march in, in Holland where teams from all over the world compete, or it's not really a competition, it's sort of a, a friendly, um, friendly meet where everybody goes and does this march. And they said, well, it's not a competition, but don't come in last. And the effect of everybody not wanting to be last means that it really is a competition. And I pity the poor people that come in last. So they wanted to make sure everybody was in good shape for this, this march. So I volunteered for this and we would spend all of our time training away from the garrison area. And out there when I was marching in the field, I was unstoppable. I mean, I, I could march 25 miles with a 30 pound Alice pack, full TA-50, no problem. And then I'd go back to the garrison and I could hardly stand up. So I uh, realized that the, the garrison area, the entire area itself was affecting me and in sheer desperation because the building with its flooded basement was the worst area, I would sneak out to the motor pool, climb under the camouflage nets and sleep out there so that I could try to recover and get away from the mold for a little while. So it was clear from my military experience that something about this black mold was highly immunosuppressive. It affected my entire unit. And in order to stay away from it, simply walking out of the building wasn't quite sufficient. I had to not only get away from the area, but it was on my clothes. And that really set me up for what happened later with the chronic fatigue syndrome in incident when I became aware that uh, there were other people like me. They were highly affected from the sick buildings, the clusters of chronic fatigue syndrome, what they were calling mystery malady at the time. And these people, when I stood next to them, I would get reactions. So I actually led them to the worst areas, to the bad buildings, said there's something here and we really need to look into it. And uh, that's when I found that the CDC, Center for Disease Control, the researchers who came to investigate the mystery malady, all doctors, even allergists and immunologists had absolutely no awareness of the immunosuppressive effects of toxic mold. Thank you for that, Eric. Um, one thing that you had mentioned to Keely and I was um, when you were in the army, your commander or your leader had mentioned to you that um, another country or, you know, the opposing party that you're fighting against could possibly use low level immune system agents. Can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, that actually came from um, basic biological warfare training. The um, first lecture from the instructor talked about some of the characteristics of biological weapons and got into the um, 
application of low level immune suppressants on the population. They said um, it was possible that the enemy would attempt to demoralize the uh, population, not just the, uh, the soldiers in the battlefield, but the entire civilian population by spreading these low level immune suppressants that would allow any infection to get out of control. And this uh, would uh, weaken the, uh, the morale and cause confusion among doctors who would see infections lighting up for no apparent reason. And I asked my uh, trainer, well, if doctors see a pattern of everybody getting sick from anything and everything all at once, then they'll know to look for something deeper. They'll, they'll realize that there's something else going on. Maybe um, a biological weapon of, of harassment has been deployed. And my trainer said something really surprising. He said, no, Johnson, doctors will not notice. They will blame whatever infection comes up, the first thing they detect, and they will fight for that as being the primary cause. I said, well, won't they compare their experience to other doctors who see other infections uh, lighting up in the same area and realize that there's a broader picture to this? And I was told, uh, no, Johnson, some doctors might, but they will be suppressed because all the doctors will fight each other and they will neutralize each other until only the doctors who have a test that detects something like an activated virus will prevail. All the ones that see a broad picture of immune suppression, they'll be knocked out and they will be unable, their perspective will be um, suppressed by all this confusion from competing doctors. I was really amazed by this that this was actually factored into military intel that they knew they could set doctors to work fighting each other by application of these agents. So during the Tahoe outbreak, when doctors all saw different infections and fought for them, I realized this was the exact same scenario that my trainers had prepared me for. Very, very interesting. Now, going back to that bunker that made you sick and going back to our episode that we just recorded, you had said that the mold is not the issue, it is the nanoparticles. So what do you think was happening in that bunker that caused that toxic mold to get out of hand? At the time, I blamed uh, pesticides. The uh, Nazis were well known for dousing everything with DDT. I mean, they were literally dusting their entire location. So it seemed conceivable that they had uh, probably inundated this entire bunker complex with DDT residue. And my speculation to my commanding officer was that the combination of the pesticide plus the black mold had somehow worked synergistically to um, create a super toxin. That was my working hypothesis and stayed that way for many years. And it wasn't until I learned about nanoparticles later that I realized that this actually fit the profile a little better than the um, super toxin concept did because nanoparticles fit the um, rapidly emerging atmospheric pollution that we are putting out from the uh, human industry, from smelters and warfare explosions create uh, clouds of nanoparticles. And human industry, high heat in particular, are required to produce these metallic nanoparticles. Normal fires aren't hot enough to do it takes extremely high heat. And when you um, create cement or you generate electricity by coal burning um, uh, electrical generation plants, you're breaking, you're producing a lot of 
heat and probably putting a lot of nanoparticles into the atmosphere. And the um, nanomedicine, the idea that you can use nanoparticles because they penetrate the, the lungs, get into the blood and brain, that seemed to go and fit nicely, dovetail with the concept that these mold toxins are now being introduced into the body with a um, ease that is unprecedented as this kind of illness isn't recorded in the literature. It's only within the last 30 years we're really seeing people complain about mold and chemicals in the way they are now. So it seemed like nanoparticles, increasing nanoparticle pollution as a vector for toxin transport um, kind of fit and explained everything all in one fell swoop. And I highly encourage our listeners to check out our resources below because we will link to studies and information that proves what Eric had just said, that nanoparticles do have the ability to bypass the blood brain barrier and affect the body. Um, and there, this research has been going on since, I don't know, Eric, when the early 2000s, maybe even before. Yeah, I'd say, um right around 2000 is when this new branch, this new field really started to emerge. So it was by um, the mid 2000s, about 2005, 2006, where we finally started seeing articles about uh, nanomedicine and the observation that fungi are, they can actually be used. Various species like Aspergillus are known to create nanoparticles. You can feed um, metal metallic ions to uh, fungal colonies and they will produce clouds of nanoparticles. So if one considers that nanoparticles have these uh, amazing capabilities, <laughs> it just seemed logical to put it together, put the pieces of the puzzle together. Yeah, what was an interesting study or um, an observation that we had talked about in a recording prior to the podcast was the reactor in Chernobyl. They were finding a ton of mold around the reactor. And the hypothesis is that that mold is feeding upon that radiation that that reactor is still emitting. Yeah. And the uh, a reactor obviously is going to be putting out a lot of nanoparticles. However, the um, field of man nanomedicine isn't really based on um, radiation as we think of it. It's more based upon the surface energy of nanoparticles, which is a separate matter. So it may be possible that they're, look, when they describe um, the way black mold is really taken off at the Chernobyl reactor and is growing so prolifically, that it may not be the gamma radiation, it might actually be that the mold is capitalizing on its own natural properties of processing nanoparticles and using the surface energy. Now this uh, idea of mold processing nanoparticles is not like something new and alien and foreign, it's just mold doing what mold has always done, they've always used nanoparticles in fact, nanoparticles are a normal part of our environment. They've always been around. They come from volcanoes. So it's not as if um, this is something completely separate to normal processes, but it may be that we have fed microbial colonies rocket fuel by denser alloys, nanoparticles that have um, much more you know, density the nanoparticles of the past. So it's essentially giving it rocket fuel. Some scary stuff, I would have to say. Um, but what I wanted to go back to was how you and your, your squad dealt with uh, contamination of this kind of sort of, you know, mold or of these low level uh, immune suppressing agents. Did you guys have a protocol in place? Absolutely. The um, 
idea is that every squad is becomes a self-sufficient family that you're protecting your comrades. You all work together to mitigate the um, exposure from the, the battlefield scenario. So you remove yourself from the contamination zone, the hot zone, and the protocol is to set up an isolation area and a decontamination station where every member of the squad has to pass through a vetting procedure to make sure that they aren't contaminated, assess their potential for contamination, and they, in essence, have to take a shower, strip off their gear before they can enter the sleeping area so that everybody can get a healthful restorative sleep. And meanwhile, keep your equipment nearby, even though it is still contaminated for use in case of attack. So essentially, it's just um, creating a safe zone where you monitor everything that goes in and out of your safe zone to try to limit the contamination to the maximum possible extent. When I realized that toxic mold was doing this exact same thing to me, merely passing through a plume, not just buildings, but in the storm drains, where it was giving me a lingering effect, my training kicked in. I just went through the same thing that I was trained to do. I set up a safe zone and started controlling contamination. It was as simple as that. It's not really complicated. It was just what uh, every soldier is trained to do. Now I had special training because I was in a nuclear missile unit. The uh, basic biological warfare protocol is something that every soldier has to learn. But my specialty was in low level radiation. And we were trained that contaminated objects would be discernible that you actually could feel um, metallic objects that are contaminated. And it would be a vague burning sensation, a sense of unease, and proximity to it would give headaches. And um, people would just sort of have a subtle psychological recoil. And you have to take into account that radiation is going to affect denser objects such as tanks, steel, um, your, your weapon, your helmet, differentially from, say, your cotton clothing. The same exposure to radiation um, is going to affect metal more than cotton. So whereas your, your cotton clothing might not react on the Geiger counter, your metal objects would. And it, amazingly enough, seemed to me that mold had this same exact quality, that objects that had been in a contamination area in a, in a bad building, that certain objects seemed to have a greater propensity for attracting mold than others. And in fact, it seems like cotton was a fairly low level as an attractant, whereas certain types of plas plastics that have high electrostatic energy were like super magnets for the mold toxins. So there again, my specialized training in radiation uh, actually assisted me in making this observation that plastics, which people think can be easily cleaned of mold, were actually some of the worst and most highly contaminated objects because of their electrostatic affinity to glom onto these spores and fragments from toxic mold. In other words, plastic is extremely deadly. <laughs> Not only does it harbor all of this toxicity, it also, you know, emits its own chemical toxicities in our food and everything, you know. But uh, thank you for that information. Um, there was another thing that uh, you, Keely, and I had talked about that was really interesting, and it was um, the nerve agents that could be used. Could you describe a little bit more about that? Yeah, the uh, nerve agent has a um, special quality that can easily be observed in the battlefield where extremely low level will cause uh, pinpoint pupils, reddening of the skin, muscle contractions, and psychological behaviors that are extremely distinctive 
the main one being that it will cause a rejection of the very proposition that wasn't one has been exposed to nerve agent. In essence, as an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, it shuts off the nervous system that allows you to think the very portion of the brain necessary to perceive the danger. And this causes anger. And as the uh, mental processes fall back on the more primitive parts of the brain, it creates an anger response. And this automatic denial is said to be so powerful that if you try to convince somebody that they are exposed at a very low level to nerve agent, they will actually fight you. They will attack you physically. So the, um, we saw signs of nerve agent exposure. Never approach somebody on your own because they might attack you and overpower you and try to rip off your gas mask. So when the protocol is whenever you suspect somebody might be suffering low level, for example, the, um, you know a nerve agent exposure is going on and you see somebody behaving in a strange manner, drunken, they refuse to put on their gas mask, they won't follow orders. Those who have already put on their gas mask are to tackle them as a team, to take them down and force them to wear a gas mask. And we're actually equipped with um, restraints, uh, Ziploc ties to restrain somebody, to keep their hands behind their back. Otherwise, they'll simply take off their gas mask again. And one of the peculiar things I noticed in sick buildings was the same type of denial behavior where people launch into an incredible rejection of the very proposition that the building is making them sick. So while I have no proof that toxic mold is equivalent to a nerve agent, the behaviors that we were uh, trained to observe for are very consistent with this effect. In the military, the bio warfare trainers also made it clear to us that in a battlefield scenario, while we do have detection capabilities for toxins and radiation, they will be difficult to access, they will be few and far between, and they'll probably break down under the harsh battlefield conditions. So the primary mechanism for our response was observation. They said, we don't want you to rely on testing on these um, systems that are bound to break down. Observation will keep you alive. So forget testing, use your observation and treat your observation as primary over everything else. Because if you are, if uh, say a tank is exposed to blister agent, nerve agent or radiation, the detection equipment at a distance is not going to give you information about it. If you get near that tank or that equipment, that pile of equipment that makes you sick, trust your observations first. And so this was basically instinctual for you because you've had this extensive training, this extensive knowledge when you were being slammed by these moldy buildings in Tahoe, that training and that light and that observation, all that kind of turned on for you, right? Yeah, people try to give me credit for having figured this out, but actually I have to admit, it was strictly my army training. I was drilled into this constantly it was a way of life for us. This is what we practiced out in the field. And when I ran into the same situation in civilian life, my training automatically kicked in. Simple as that. And that, you guys, is what makes Eric the mold expert. <laughs> no, I mean, um, Everyone sees what you post and they understand, you know, the story of chronic fatigue syndrome or not, but they don't know you, you know, they don't know what you went through, your training, your background. And I, I see a lot of people trying to discredit you and it's not right because you are in a way an expert in this because you do have formal training just because you might not be a PhD doctoral of whatever. I mean, 
you understand what's going on, you're making these connections that are being missed. And so far you've helped a lot of people. So thank you for that, Eric. I, I really do appreciate that from the bottom of my heart. And um, again, thank you again, Eric. And there was one last thing I wanted to ask you was the sociological implications of all of this that's been going on. Yeah, my trainers said that in addition to the doctors, the civilian population will uh, act in the same denialistic manner that uh, they will support their doctors and they will fight against the people who are obviously surviving better than others. It will actually make them angry. And I was astonished that people followed this same exact pattern that was predicted by my trainers where they rejected all the stories of those of us who became mold avoiders. And the more we tried to get through to them, the angrier they became. Now, my trainer said, eventually society will reach a point where they will notice that some of you are surviving the situation better than others. And they will eventually, after a period of much argument, start to approach you and ask, okay, what is it you're doing? And they said, because you have this training, you will survive while others will fall. And now that you have this knowledge, it is your responsibility to tell them when the time comes and they eventually start to ask why you can master this situation, situation better than they can. Yeah, you posted something funny on your page the other day. Can you talk about it? It's about uh, Darwinism. <laughs> Oh, yeah, the uh, natural selection at work. Yeah, if you uh, look at any sport, any endeavor, any skill, the people who are more successful are going to rise to the top. They'll become noticeable by how well they perform. And that's not just for mold. I mean, in hang gliding, the um, people who are more skilled at finding thermals at working the lift are going to wind up at the top of, top of the path. You have the, so if you look for who is the best at a certain skill, regardless of what it is, you look at the people who distinguish themselves by their success. And I expected that uh, because people understand this for other sports, they would apply this to mold avoidance as well. But so far, we're still in the phase where people are so angry that they're not ready to look in at those of us who are getting a little better results. In effect, they are going through the process of natural selection and by their, um, <laughs> their behavior of becoming angry rather than interested, they tend to like be less successful and weed themselves out. I thought that was funny. Um, and just for the simple fact, because I think I'm just tired of seeing or hearing people mock you and, and what you do. Um, because it's, it's probably one of the most simplest things you can do, right? It's not a magic potion pill. It's not a thousand dollar treatment in a oxygen tank. It's literally getting out of toxicity, going to a place that makes you feel good and staying there to get better. That's really what it is. Yeah, I think the important point to make about uh, the, the squad training is that people tell me, well, this is impossible. You can't do it. It's impossible to practice mold avoidance. Well, on some level, it's always possible. Simply stepping away from an area that bothers you is the initial, uh, the underpinnings of the strategy. But can a family do it? You bet. If a squad can do it, a family can do it. It probably calls for a higher degree of cooperation than you would expect from a normal family setting, but under harsh circumstances, yes, it can be done. Absolutely, and uh, I just want to shout out to Brian Rosner. Uh, he's one that has been doing it successfully with his family. I mean, it, it goes to show that if people are determined enough, if they want to take control of their illness, there is something they can do about it. It's all up to them. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, Eric, for a great episode. It's just, 
it's been wonderful. I, I'm really excited for what's to come. Um, we do have a very special guest that we are interviewing tomorrow and Wednesday, two special guests. And uh, we look forward to providing that information to you guys. Uh, I don't want to say exactly who it is, so we'll keep the suspense running here. <laughs> but uh, anyways, please like, share, comment in our content. Um, also, feel free to donate to our Patreon and GoFundMe pages to keep this podcast rolling. We will have it linked below. Thank you again for all those that have donated. Kathleen, I'm calling you out there, girl. I just got your donation. Thank you so, so much. We really appreciate you. And uh, on our next episode, we will be diving more into nanopathology and nanoparticles and how they affect the body. And uh, from there, we will release our interview with our special guest to confirm that. And uh, yeah, we look forward to recording another episode and providing you guys with the, the most up-to-date information on toxic mold and your health. Thanks again.